Lord, I thank you that you're present and I thank you that your people are hungry for you. Lord, it's just for you. It's <laughs> they're just hungry for you. And we so often keep people back. So Lord, we just say, we just break it free, break it open. And that includes in me, Lord, any barriers, any fear of man or woman, any of that stuff, I just break it off. This is about you and your word. Bring it, Lord. Everybody say, bring it, Lord. Bring it, Lord. Amen. So be it. Okay. So if you didn't get the ping, no worries. But this says aligned for anointing, not covered for control. Now, I need you to see our model. I mean, most of you know this, but some, we keep getting new people on the web, on the replay. Our model is an aircraft carrier. Okay? It's not about a building. It is about moving the heirs. You are all joint heirs with Jesus, and you are his craftsmanship. So you are an aircraft, therefore. And we're, our job is to help get you where you need to go and to get you refueled and calibrated and armed and briefed and prepped and then launched out. You see that line that he's lining up on, or she is, whoever's piloting that thing? That'd be you. That plane represents your skills, your giftings, your talents. You have a will, that's the pilot in there. You have a decision. And we're finding more and more people are just feeling like they're under some sort of covering, but it feels like a lot of control. And we're entering something new now. And we want to encourage you for freedom. And we don't know exactly what that looks like for you. So the chances are it may get messy. But you know what? God's okay with messy. I know that because at the very beginning in Genesis, it talks about the spirit hovered over the face of the deep and it was formless and void. And if you feel like you got a part of your life that's a little formless and void, a little chaotic, okay? It's right in Genesis 1. He's, he's okay with that. We get freaked out. <gasps> He's like, it's okay. I got you, Kay. Hang in through this time. So as we talk about this, because we're going to talk about alignment versus covering, I just need to make sure you get my heart and mindset in this, okay? I am one of the most reluctant people about this in many ways that you've ever met, because I have no desire, I have no desire, I have no desire to be like well-known or anything, okay? Just... I used to, <laughs> and God broke that out of me, beat that crap out of me, literally, okay? So it's like, okay, I don't want it. So it's one of those really reluctant kind of things. That's my heart set. But at the same time, there's, there's a frustration for me of feeling driven out and away from most of what we would call the institutional structure of the church. I just call it IS, institutional structure. The church is the body of Jesus. Some are in and out of that institutional structure, some are not, okay? You go back to St. Augustine, you look at Calvin and others, it's called the visible versus the invisible church. It's nothing new. It's wheat and tares if you want Jesus, okay? It's, anyway, on and on and on. But what God's been showing me is that he's stirring up something new, not because he's rejecting the old, but because it's hard for us to change. And we say we want change until it shows up. <laughs> and then we go, well, I wasn't going to look like that. Right? We just thought it was going to be a little, take a little bit off the edges. And God comes in and gives us a mohawk. And we're like, what? Said, well, you want to change. Yeah, but not that much change. He is in that habit because it's going to shift us out of our comfort zone all the time and make us completely dependent upon him. And it's going to make a show whether we've got one world in one foot in the world and one out, or whether we're both in whichever way, right? It's just it's going to be a decision time. But I feel like God's been showing me this that there's this track that's going down, and there's train cars on it, and this passage, and that's often the institutional church that I'm seeing a lot of it go. And there's good things happening, and there's not good things happening. It's a mix, but He's laying down another set of tracks right next to it. And it's this spontaneous thing, and I don't even know all that it's going to look like, but you're part of, of that hunger. You're here because there's something that is or isn't happening on the other tracks that's bugging you. And you're saying, God, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. There's got to be more. And you keep coming and you keep leaning in. So the question is, what do you do when you're on that? 
Where, where do you belong? Are you just rebellious? Are you just evil? Are you just dissatisfied and you're just kind of one of those ne'er-do-wells? Or is your heart just really longing for Jesus, for a connection with him, and you keep running into, it's not the people, it's the structure. I, I was mentoring a young leader, a young apostle, and, and came to said to one time when he was taking over this work that, you know what, it's not that there's going to be one person set against you or a group of people, it's just gravity. It's just you put that many people together for that many years and it creates its own gravity. We can do the same here, okay? We're constantly aware of the danger of gravity. What we do here, we move in the times and seasons. We try to align with what we understand, how God's moving through time, because that keeps us open for what the new thing is. We, keep, we just keep redialing to, okay, God, what are you doing now? Assuming it's new. One of my favorite phrases is, what's next? Because I can't change what was. It's just, okay, what's next, God? I don't want to get hung up there. I want to keep moving, okay? So that's what we're doing. So out of that, we talk about alignment. Is alignment important? Yes. Okay. Now, fortunately, we have a chiropractor here tonight. <laughs> so if you wonder at all about alignment in the back and how important it is, he can give you the whole line, nine yards, right? Because how many of you have been to a chiropractor? Okay. And you get things realigned, right? It's not always easy. It's not always comfortable. But why do they do that? What is the bottom line core reason for alignment? Travis, he didn't know I was going to call him or talk about this per se. What? Core. Yeah, what's the bottom line reason for getting aligned? Why is it important you be aligned? Your spine. The at ease. So the body is at ease, okay? At ease. And it's the life flow. When you're not in alignment, you're kinked up. I had a picture of a kinked hose in here for a while. And if you go to use a hose and you stretch it out and suddenly it's like this dribble, you go, what is going on? It's gotten out of alignment, right? So you twist it and twist it and suddenly it pops up and you're like, okay. So getting this addressed and making sure that you're properly aligned. By the way, Travis has a specialty where they deal with the atlas, which is the first one there. And a large part of his practice is just around the understanding that if you have to get the first part aligned properly, so the rest of it. Because if that part's pushed out, everything else tries to adjust. And you've been to a lot of places, probably some of you in certain institutional structures where that one atlas was kind of pushed out of place and the whole body was trying to adjust. Okay, right? Similar. Now, how about this? How many of you have had your car tires aligned? Do you know what it means, right? They're aligned this way, so they're running in the same direction. Sometimes you'll have two front tires and they're working against each other, right? They're pitched in. And what happens? The, the tread on that part of it just starts to go or they'll be pitched out, or the back are not pitched out. What happens to your tires if they're not properly aligned? You have to get new ones, right? Yeah, they just kind of wear out. What's really frustrating is they just wear on one part. You're like, wait a minute, I got the rest of the tires good. Yeah, but this part's just that thin. They're out of alignment. And so getting it in proper alignment, I think we're probably good. And there is something about when things are in alignment that just, that just feels right to us, whether it's you know, military, whether it's in nature or whether it's somebody just getting a cute photo. There's something about <laughs> alignment, right? But doesn't that, it's just like, I could have had them all, but it would have been the same. They're like, okay, that's cool. So the thing about alignment, here's a definition for you, definition of alignment. The act of aligning or state of being aligned, that's sort of like, okay. It's actually based on a French word, alignment, and it means to just line up, to put it in a straight line. But we'll put this, the proper positioning of parts in relation to each other. And part of the challenge is with this hunger many people are having for God, they're not quite sure how to relate to the other parts. Do you get it? Mm -hmm. And God's like going, it's okay, I've got something I'm doing. Do you, I know this is going to be dangerous, but I need you to understand, has God left the synagogue in the world? The synagogues around the world, he has not. The Torah is still being read. There's a veil, but he has not given it up. But then because of rejection, he had to start something else. Okay? But he hasn't given it up. You have to understand, behold, I do a new thing. When Peter ha had this episode with the sheet, right? And he's in Cornelius' house, and the spirit falls on the Gentiles. The first thing that happens is he get called on the carpet to Jerusalem. What the heck are you doing? That's not the way we do it, right? 
God keeps doing a new thing. We keep having to adjust to it. So he's in a pro position now, a, a process now of the proper positioning of the parts in relationship to each other. It's one of the reasons probably that drew you here. It's informing a line that's pretty straightforward. It's arrangement of groups or forces in relation to one another. There are many things that God is about and he is beginning to connect dots of those of us who are feeling like there's got to be more and something about the old structure. It's not the people, but the structure of things prohibits what we think God wants to do. And so he's connected us now with people down in Florida and in California and in Texas and in Virginia and on and, you know, it just, it just goes. And it's a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, but you get the feeling that there's more. And then he will break you out of alignment. Some of you know I was involved in a prison ministry on Monday nights for three or four years. And basically they booted me out because I hadn't done certain things. And I wouldn't do anything bad. I just hadn't gone through specific training. But now God has rearranged that so I get to start something new there around discipleship. Okay, you, you got to be aware that when, and did it hurt at first when I got this? Oh yeah, it hurt like hell. But I had to just walk it through, go, okay, God, what do you got? What's next? What's next? Now, it took me days to get there, okay? <laughs> you don't be in denial. It's like, okay, that really hurt. It brought up a lot of stuff. But let me just contrast, because many of us came out of a background where it was about covering. So I've got a manhole cover, a man covering his, his, uh, his wife's girlfriend's eyes, and this thing that kind of gets down to having control over something. So covering is just something that covers or conceals, right? How many of you said, well, well, they're my covering? How many of you used that phrase before? Okay, yeah. And that was an understanding. Now, I want you to know that neither alignment nor covering per se are strict biblical terms. They're terms we have defined in order to do that. Are there things you draw down from? Yes, you know, but it's interesting. There's oversight, there's other things, but it's not covering. And covering tends to be of one of two things. Let me give you definitions of cover. Right here, to guard from attack. Do you like that? Do you like to be guarded from attack? Absolutely, it's not a bad thing to hide from sight or knowledge. That can be good or bad. Sometimes I want to be hidden. Sometimes it's like, why are you covering me up? Okay. How about this one? To lay or spread something over and then finally to have as one's territory or field of activity. So a lot of times cover became more and more synonymous with a level of control because we're trying to protect you from an attack, Henry. You can't manage this on your own. You go out there, you're going to get slaughtered. We've got to make sure you lead them to the right Jesus, you know? Okay, and it's, I know it's well intended. The challenge is, is that because of the structural issues, it just more and more constrained, more and more control. And for some, they're comfortable. You know what? How many of you actually would prefer, in many ways, just to be told what to do? Depends on the day. Depends on the day, yeah. <laughs> No, I know. You will see this again and again. Uh, years ago, I was in Moscow on a project over there and uh, got to know some of the Russians there. And they said, one of the phrases in Russia is, Russia likes a broad back. In other words, they want a strong leader. They kind of, they, they've been so used to being told what to do. They kind of prefer that. It makes it easier. Not my fault, not my responsibility. Just, you know, sometimes it's much easier. Okay, and so sometimes we'll give away something because there's security in that because ultimately then I'm not to blame. Okay, so this is a well-known scripture. Who could read this out? Dave, you're right here near the microphone. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen? Amen. Where is this found? Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. You know it. Know it well, right? So we've been picking on this bit by bit. Keep going, Dave. That we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things in him who is head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together 
by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Okay, that kind of a long paragraph? You okay, you still awake here? Okay, I'm sorry, but I wanna print it out to you. There's a whole process that I trained in years ago when I did a master's in theology at seminary called diagramming sentences, where you figure out what goes where and what's important and everything else. And Paul was just like, oh my goodness. Okay, some of you know how to do that, right? When you, we had to do it in the Greek, which would made it even more fun, okay? But let me, let me just hit two things. One is this phrase about equipping of the saints, which was buried for years. We always thought that all these, these offices of apostle, prophets, evangelists, etc., was just to do the work. And suddenly we discovered, wow, it was about equipping others. But we only got part of that right. Because then what we do is we set up a structure where we identify that's the apostle, that's the prophet, that's the teacher, that's the pastor, that's the evangelist. And you know what? All we've done is create a different kind of structure. Because here's the reality of it. Do you know this phrase that Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America? It means because racially and by minority and ethnic groups and so forth, that's when we really segregate. I agree it's the most segregated hour in America, but here's my point. It's not about race. It's the most segregated because you have two-tier Christianity. You have the specialists and the ones that are supposed to do it, and then you have all the rest of us kind of dumb sheep, right? And it's very sacred. Oh, there's, oh, they're the spiritual ones. The, oh, yeah. And then there's everybody else just kind of shuffles in and shuffles out. It's extremely segregated. We're not trying to. It just happens. Because we don't understand that even when we're equipped, well, I'm an equipper. I'm an equipper. Let me just show you what this word actually means. The Greek means actually it's about setting a bone. It's about something that's come out of alignment and you set it. It is about getting things in alignment for the alignment of the body. Do you know how that spine functions? So that the, the body is at ease and the life flows. And you know what? It's not just for the spine, because when you do that, then suddenly the hand stops to tingle and the foot starts to work, right? It has all this functionality to it. It's not about the spine. The spine is so that the rest of it works. It brings alignment through so that life will flow through. And then it's to what end? If you were to diagram it and everything else, well, I didn't bother with all that, but I'm going to give you this. This is what it is, that we may grow up. That we may grow up. That we may grow up. and not be babies just wanting the milk. Yeah, yeah. right? Or we're, we're baying and, and you know, biting each other as sheep, right? And we don't understand. And, and Paul makes a very clear point. You know, you gotta get beyond milk into real meat. You're here in part because you're hungry for the meat. Because we, I'm sorry, we don't do a lot of milk here. And sometimes people watch this and go, man, I had to come. I think Gail even said, I had to be, I had to come back for six months before I understood what you were saying. It's true. I did. I had to come back for a year. Oh, for you. Okay, yeah, she didn't come back for a year. So take heart, though, if you're watching this, because there's a hunger in you for more, and I don't do it lightly. I tend to go in a little bit more kind of bleh. But it's really about growing up because we don't see you as some helpless person that we need to put under a tarp and control and chain down. We see you as armed and dangerous. And you are already, because you're moving out there. And whether you're moving in, in aligned with Jesus and in dangerous for good, hey, sir, sorry, <laughs> or you're out there just causing a disaster wherever you go, but you're armed, right? The words of your mouth. And you're dangerous. We just want you to grow up into him. So here's another. This is an order. Apostles, prophets, as it goes down, it's not a hierarchy. This is the thing. I pulled out some slides, but read this. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the ecclesia. I want you to notice that I use the word ecclesia, which is the original Greek, not the common translation. That's the King James Version that says church. King James wanted that translation of ecclesia because it stood for a religious order or a building. Ecclesia means those who are gathered out to legislate. 
who meet in with an authority. It's not about a religious order, and it's not about a building. But if you're king, the last thing you want to do is talk to your citizens about being a legislated body that gathers in authority. Okay? Just a brief lesson there. And that appointed, don't get over that. That just means to set in place. It's a passive verb. In other words, you get set there. This is not something you strive for. This is something that God does. In fact, the first use of this word in Greek is when Jesus says you don't take a lamp and place it under a bushel. That lamp is placed. Do you get this? So you need to understand, somebody who's in an office of one of these has been placed there because it's God has set these people. God. Okay, so first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healing, helps, administration, variety of tongues. There is an order here, but it's not a hierarchy. The atlas in the vertebrae is not a hierarchy, but it's an order. Is the atlas better than any of the other spinal cord? Okay, is it, are, are the, some of the others not necessary? They're all necessary. It just happens to be the one in that place, right? And so it's one that if you tweak, it has particular ramifications. God has been reestablishing the office of apostle and prophet in the church for the last 20, 30 years. You're aware of that because you're here. Some people, I'm already going to be burned as a heretic for saying that. They're comfortable with teachers, although worker of miracles and gifts of healing, yikes. Variety of tongues, yikes. Okay, now we start doing the Thomas Jefferson Bible. We start cutting out parts we don't like, okay? <laughs> Hey, trust me, I was raised originally that none of that existed. So I could give you all the theological argument. It's, it's a long workaround. Yeah, so. Okay. And the reason I want to show this is not a hierarchy because Jesus says, you know that the way of the Gentiles is to lord it over them. If you're first, then you lord it over everybody else. But what does he say here? Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. So leadership, if you're in a role of an apostle, is from down here. Okay, I had a slide out here years ago, right? The, the, you know the, the uh, pyramid. pyramid, thank you, yeah. Yeah, well, no, the pyramid of organizations. You have the CEO, the vice president, you have the general managers, and then you have the frontline workers, right? Years ago in the 80s, I read a book when I got into business called Thriving on Chaos by Tom Peters. And one of the things that blew my mind is he showed that pyramid spun around so that the CEO is there to support the need of the VPs, who are there to support the general manager, who is supporting the frontline workers. It completely flipped it around as far as how it got done. The church is still operating around this for the most part. Oops. And as a result, right now in the United States, on average, it takes six full-time pastors and pastoral staff for one convert. Over the last 50 years, there has been no net increase in church attendance in any county. Churches are dying regularly at the rate of 1,500 per month. But those people are mostly just migrating to somewhere else. And it's because we're still working this. Well, we show up and you do it. God's like, no, that's not my way. My way is from the bottom. I serve. We are to serve what needs to be done. But if you go in, and I know that there are so many that are in that institutional structure, their hearts are to serve. But as a result, they're just serving themselves out. They don't know how to get the others properly aligned, so they're just exhausted. They're just burned out. My dad was a pastor. I watched it. He'd go in a room. He could feel the need of every person in there and felt responsible for everyone. Didn't know enough about alignment to try to get people freed up to move in the juice that he moved in. You get on this so far? Okay. Yeah. You making sense, I hope. Why this order? Let me just hit this. This is something I got out of Danny, I think Danny Silk, out of uh, Bethel. The primary focus of apostles and prophets is this way. They have to be very focused as an office to make sure that we're staying connected with heaven and bringing an atmosphere of heaven down. That has got to be their focus. And if you look at this, you'll find in Acts 6 when, and there arose a murmur. There was an issue in the early church, right? First chapter, first verse of chapter 6. Everybody who's ever been a pastor knows that verse. And there arose a murmur. But what they said is they said, you know what? It's not right for us to give up 
the ministry of the word and prayer. They had to keep this going. So they said, we need you to appoint somebody who can do this part. So the primary office of apostle and prophet is to try to keep a heaven atmosphere and alignment and to create a place of honor and freedom. Wherever you are, we were in worship, right? And I, I said to those of you new, you know, if you want to sit down, stand up, raise your hands, dance, lay down and sleep. We, we really don't have, I've had people who've been out like in the spirit, or at least they said they were, you know. I mean, maybe they were actually, I need you to know how I don't really care because if this is the place where they can come and find peace and be in that level of rest, then bless them. I, I'm not, I don't, yeah. I don't even like watching the replays of these things when I check the editing on them, right? Okay, I don't need to hear my voice or see if someone else is, okay? And then when you, the prophetic, by the way, this is another understanding, prophetic, even though it's apostle, prophet, it's the prophetic arm that has to hear what is the Spirit saying to the church. So then the apostle knows how to war and how to build with what's been released. I've run into people before, very apostolic, but not enough prophetic. So they get a plan, they think they've got a plan, and it's all about organization and structure and having more meetings and doing this. And meanwhile, God's like going, okay, well, that was then, but I've left and moved this way without the active prophetic understanding of how God's moving. Jerry Hardis, uh, one of our dear friends, in fact, the guy who first lit me up in a conversation, and he said, you know, you're not so much an institutional church, you're more like an aircraft carrier. He's in the back back there, so you gotta say, what are you thinking? Okay, and he just blew, blew my head off. But we have to, the reason he asked, is it easier for you on what to teach, given that you move in alignment with the times and seasons? I said, well, it's easier because I feel like God is, is set certain things anchored in time so that we, we move on that, because then he's got the next thing. So rather than sitting there going, okay, God, what do you want to do now? I feel like he's given me places in his word, because I'm a word, I, I move prophetically, but it's always anchored in word. For this reason, if I'm wrong, all I've done is point you to scripture. Okay? Now, I might not have gotten the interpretation just right, but you and Jesus will work that out, and I'll get, he'll straighten me out too. But my concern is first for you. I don't want to lead you astray. Okay, and then these other offices, the primary focus for teacher, pastor, evangelist is here. Do you get that? Hey, how you doing? Do you understand this part? Hey, let's go out and witness. Okay, that, that's, now you're engaging heaven in there, but the apostle prophetic has to got to keep this open and keep an atmosphere of honor and freedom. Well, I don't believe in this, this, and this. That's okay. Welcome. Do you love Jesus? Are you seeking him? Well, I want to do, okay. There's honor and freedom because firmly committed to the unique DNA that God has put in you for his glory. So the last thing I want to do is make Kay just like me. All I want to do is help Kay become who Kay is. And there's been clutter and junk and ways she's been trapped down and everything else. We just want her free. Yes. And I may not even know what to do with Kay at that point. Then send her out somewhere else. <laughs> but that's not my issue. Then I'll just have to adjust. There's one Jim Shadrick. There's one Mike Rance. Thank God, there's only one Jackie. No, um, <laughs> she knew I was gonna. She knew I was gonna set that. Okay. Okay. So it's a lot around the horizontal. Are you, you good with this? Okay. Because you need to understand this for alignment purposes and how does this work. And by the way, in each of these offices, there's not only a what they move in, because different apostles and prophets for alignment will have a different flavor. They'll have a what that they move in more powerfully, what their specific anointing is for, and they'll have a different how. You know, the manner in which they move. And you need to be aware of those dynamics because as you align, you start to move in that. There's an upside and there's a downside. I want a variety of people coming in here and speaking over you and releasing things, but I am careful, not so much about what they're gonna say, because I never give them something to say, it's just who they are. Because I know that imprints by the Spirit. And it could be something I don't even necessarily agree in, but if it's Holy Spirit, I want that. If it's encouraging your freedom, I want that. 
If it's trying to constrain you, put you in a box, cover you up with something, eh, I don't think so. You good so far? Making any sense? So under the new apostolic alignment that God has been establishing, it's really keyed into the heart of a father. But I have to ask this, what kind of father? For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This is Paul having to exert his authority. Okay, It's a rare thing. Under the new apostolic lining, it's not a thing you assert. It's not a force. It's not a control. It's an influence. It's a relationship. And it comes into the relationship as a father. By the way, the contrast here is countless guides, which is a Greek word that can be translated tutor or guardians. In other words, though you have 10,000 guardians, oh my goodness, that's actually the number. It's not countless, it actually is 10,000. All these people trying to make sure. I like this translation. There are a lot of people around you that can't wait to tell you what you've done wrong, but there aren't many fathers willing to take the time and effort to help you grow up. This is the new, okay? One of the nicest compliments I've been paid. It's okay, Dave, just knock it around a little more. <laughs> Thank God there's only one Dave. So, no. <laughs> one of the best compliments I've been paid is, is uh, a young leader that I'm, I'm mentoring. He said, you know, I love your father's heart because you listen to me, you support me, and you don't try to control me. Mm -hmm. And everybody else who's tried to come in alongside us has tried to control. Oh, this is the way you have to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful that he sees that because that is my heart for him. And now he has been gathering other people that have aligned with him and saying, I need you to meet this man. Let him be for you as he is to me. Now, whether that works or not, I'm not going to force that. I'll go where I'm invited. I'm not going to press. Okay. This is really critical because this has been a psalm, Psalm 133, that has often been used to keep the rabble-rousers in a line. Okay. Uh, who can read this? Jackie, I picked on you so you can. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Now, I want to tell you, this is not a psalm about unity. This is a psalm about anointing, and ultimately, it goes down to the bottom line. How many of you got the ping and did what I asked? I asked you to read this, after you read it, to read it backwards. Begin with the end in mind is a phrase that Stephen Covey came up with back in the 80s. Very powerful. In other words, you got to know where you end up. The end of this is where this ends up, is life. Say life. Life. Okay, this a word evermore in the Hebrew means actually to disappear. It's like, uh, for those of you who run a marathon, it's something called a vanishing point psych out. It's when you turn a corner and the next corner is so far you can't see where it is and it messes with your brain because you're weary. Okay, that's what this is, is that forevermore you can't, it vanishes. You can't see it. And the word is kayam, like life, right? We're talking about, that's a key, the number eight, we're in the year 5778, 2018, that number eight in a, is a Hebrew letter, het, okay? And that is the first in the word life. And it's used 796 times in the Hebrew Bible, in your Bible, in Hebrew. That's where it's going. It's the dew of Hermon. But you see this part here in the center? It's like the precious oil on the head running down running down you've got to just think this is not a little anointing this is like a bucket and who is it being pointed out poured out on air the high priest the high priest today in a functionality would be somebody who's functioning as an apostle it's the anointing that the apostle is going to carry and it's going to dribble down and where's it going to go on the beards and down to where the edge of the garments this is an alignment psalm and I want to tell you something else, for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's not the best translation. Go into the Hebrew and look. It's about where they can, they can be together. It's not about them being in uniformity. It's the fact that they'll line up right like that spine that's gotten adjusted correctly. And L2 is different than L3, than L5, than on and on and on. Than, the atlas. They're different. They're supposed to be, but they're aligned. They get along. They're not competing. How many of you had, you know, 
vertebrae that are competing. Right? Okay, yeah. This one's going that way, this one's going that way. I've gone to Travis, he's shown me this thing. I'm like, oh my goodness. In fact, Jerry went to him and we were trying to figure out how Jerry was walking at all. Because it's like, oh my goodness. It just, it was gnarly. But too often this has been used, hey, you know, it's good and pleasant when brethren dwell together in unity. Stop that. Well, I was just trying to, yeah, but that's. We don't do that. You, you, we don't do that? You know, you're going to upset. I don't believe that. <laughs> no, I mean, that's what they say. Okay, now, you have to understand where we come from. There's an old saying, right? We are Hebraic roots. Yes. Jesus is still Jewish. Okay. Yes. He's still Jewish, born that way, still is. There's a saying that wherever you have two Jews, you have three opinions. Okay, come on. You know what? It's because they're very free to talk. The dialectic, the didactic method that Jesus taught him was question and answer. He asked like three hundred and some odd questions, and he only answered like three. Do you get? Because he was drawing out, drawing out, drawing out. Hey, who do they say that I am? Yeah, but who do you say I am? Right? Looking for the moment, asking the question. This is how I have learned to function. I am far more comfortable now. I want to ask questions. I sit down when I'm mentoring something. I just want to get down to the core of who they were. I met with this group, and, and it was like it was small enough so I could do this. I said, okay, you got one hour, one hour only to do anything, anywhere, with any number of people, no resource constraint. What do you do? What makes you come alive? Oh, wow, yeah. just one thing? Yeah, just one thing. I'm just trying to get, I'm just trying to call out what's in there. I don't want to print something on it. I want to call up what's there. I want to give them freedom. I don't want to cover it. I want to align it. I want to give them permission to be wild and dangerous and crazy. Awesome. Last thing on this. This is a song of ascents. Do you remember what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks? Blessed is he whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. A song of ascent is one, they think it's either used by the priests as they would go up the stairs, more likely it's when you did the pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year. This is a psalm for when you're on the journey. If you're just stuck somewhere and you're just trying to build your little fortress kingdom, and the church of the everlasting, uh, we got you and we're never going to let you go, this ain't for you, which is funny because this is the one that will be uh, being, you know, it's pleasant when brothers dwell in unity. You're not being unity. Well, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not supposed to be the same as Travis. Or the same as Kathy Parker back there. It's not that guy. Don't try to make me like her or her like me. Please, we need the distinction. This new move is trying to make sure that people have the deep, passionate alignment and freedom to move in who they are and what they are. You good on this? Okay. I want to bring this up just because these were two comments that I found that I felt very helpful. In verse 2, the threshold repetition, running down, running down, and down in Hebrew, uses the same verb each time, emphasizes that the blessing of Aaron's anointing was from above himself. That is from God. This is not a matter of, of Aaron. This is flowing down above. This is coming from the Lord. And this part, in short, true unity, like all good gifts, is from above. It's bestowed rather than contrived. A blessing far more than an achievement. You need to send that to your local congressman. Okay. <laughs> well, we got enough problems in the body of Jesus, okay? But it comes from above. It's supposed to come from above. It's not an achievement. It's a blessing that comes. As I move aligned with the anointing, and it's about life, the reason that a large part of the world of the United States has moved away from the institutional structure of the church is they just don't see any life there. They don't see any life there. It feels dour and sour and constrained and I gotta dress a certain way and show a certain time and so forth. And it's just like, wow, okay. They wanna be expressive, they wanna be engaged, but you know what, their deep need is being heard as an individual. Don't try to convert me, are you willing to be involved in the grit of my life? So Jesus sits down on the wall of a well at midday with a woman of ill repute and he starts talking to her and asking her for water and starts this whole conversation. And then when he's got the point, he zings her 
with a word of knowledge. Because it's enough time now, I need you to know, I get you. I know you're here in the heat. I know you've got five husbands. And I know you're not married now with a guy. I get it. It's okay. I'm involved here. I'm not dismissing you. See, the world is hungry for those encounters, and we're wired so that we can have them. The idea of the anointing is that we come into the move of the Holy Spirit so that he can tell us things we wouldn't know otherwise. He can give us eyes and ears to hear. Helen Shadrach sometimes says, you know, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do this. All I can do is really love people. I'm like, oh my goodness. Would that so many people who could speak so eloquently and make such a great argument could love like Helen loved? Okay? She draws people. Never, never, ever underestimate that. Where knowledge tends to puff up, love builds up. Okay? Oh, we're good on so far? So, what do you know? Where have we heard the scripture before? Okay. Well, Debbie, you're going to have to read this. Wow. Okay, loudly. Again, he said to me, again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. This is an amazing word. Does it happen? Yep. Not right away. And here's part of the issue with alignment. Sometimes we think we're doing stuff and we haven't followed it through. So let's just keep going. Read the next part, Debbie. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bo dry bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over. But there was no breath in them. Welcome to Church Reorg 101. Well, you know, all we need is fivefold here. So, Leroy, you can make a good apostle, and uh, Jackie will make you the prophet, and, you know, Henry, you can, okay, and we put all this together. Wait a minute, maybe we need to have some more meetings. Get a new worship leader in here. I'm saying, all right, come on, I'm being. But it's deeply saddening because then we go, you know what, we've done it. We've, we've got it. And it's like, there's more. God gave him a command and he, he prophesied, but it didn't all happen at once. There's times you've got to press and you've got to press. You've got to get into the anointing, into the anointing. And it takes the breath of the lion. Go ahead. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. You see that part, that breath is the, is the anointing. You can put... Somebody in the office of possible, if you're not aligned in that anointing, it's not going to be alive. But there, here's another interesting point. Now, maybe I'm pushing this too far out, but I think there's three things because there's three distinctive words in here in the Hebrew. That's where I always go back to the original text. First, there is breathing. The breath goes in and it's alive. It's not moving. It's just laying there. <laughs> You get this? Three distinct words. Secondly, it stood up on its feet. The bodies did. But even that wasn't enough. There was a third thing, which was what? It became a great army. Do you understand? As the move comes in by the Spirit, under the alignment, there's life that will come in, but a lot of people will then just lay there. Oh, well, this is nice. Some will stand on their feet. Oh, well, I'm here. I'm alive. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you. But see, there's a final phase, which is about forming a great army. God is reinstating the draft. Okay? He is reinstating the draft. But here is the big difference. This is not that you're being drafted to do something that is not, you mean I got to go like clean toilets or scrub pots or 
No, the fact of the matter is you're being drafted for who you are and what you have a deepest passion to do because the only way that you can really move in that is to be fully aligned and fully free as who you are. He created you for this. He's not interested in trying to shove you down some other hole. Now, there's a lot of stuff that might have to get broken off because you might want to do that, which really isn't your heart desire, but you know what? That seems impressive. Well, then I'll be known. Then I'll be somebody. It's kind of like, you know what? I know you. You are somebody to me. That's not what's going to make you come alive. You try to do that. You try to perform that like a monkey standing up there on a cage. It ain't going to work. This is really, so he sometimes has to move us, right? I thought, I thought when we kind of got in here and we started this thing seven years ago, okay, oh, Wow, great things are going to go, right? I get to go to Texas, and I did it. This apostolic center's arising. Okay, you know, phone's going to ring off the hook. <laughs> and God had to so break me down to the point where I'm just like, I don't have any desire or need to do that. I just want to see people move in freedom. I, I really, I just, I just want to, I want to help them do that. And a lot of times, you can't do that in a bigger group. You know, because there's so much gravity in the room. Just people coming together. It just kind of sucks it in, right? And I told this guy, was, you know, it's not that you can see gravity, but it affects you. Okay. So what is happening? I had you read this. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. This is happening a lot. There's a lot of us who have felt like we just can't fit. Some have been driven out. Some have just said, my heart, I can't stay here any longer under that structure. So we head out to the desert and everyone who is in distress, everyone who is in debt, everyone who is di discontented gathered to him. Okay, here you are, David. <laughs> God, would it be so difficult? You could send me some other people. Instead, they're in distress, they're debt, they're discontented, and then, but he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Now, let me just give you quickly, I know I'm taking too long here. In distress means that they were in a narrow place. How many of you felt in a narrow place? Okay, I need you to understand this from a spiritual basis. Where I tried to go, it just felt too narrow. I wasn't able to be. What I, what I felt like God was stirring in me. For this in debt, that actually means that you're under usury. That means you've, you've had to borrow something and it's been charged back at exorbitant interest. And then discontent means grieved, vexed, or even becoming bitter. This is a large part of who is out there, folks. And they're out there in droves. They have left the institutional structure and they are hungry for somebody to say, come and see. They don't want to be sold. They want to be invited by somebody who's found life. Mm -hmm. And if it ain't here for you, no problem. Go find it. And if you can't find it, start it. Okay? We got, you know, we have people here that are starting new small groups. Leroy and Jean have started one now. Talking with Travis and Kathy, they're going to be starting stuff. Folks up in up in uh, Noonan, they've started three different groups. It's just Hey, we're going to do something out at the prison. I'd love to see if we get something going out in the military, in the Air Force Base. And something, what do you need? This isn't about control. It's about alignment. Okay. So, let me just cover some quick things on this. I, you okay? Or am I blowing your... You're good. I'm giving you an anchoring? Okay. Go ahead. Different types of alignment. This is something I pulled from Peter Wagner, bless his soul, who died last year. I, I miss the fact of him because he was a great splainer. Kim's name for him. He just could be clear about things. And I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that he was part of who commissioned me because I picked up that, some of that juice. But there's vertical alignment, okay? So this is what we traditionally think. You're thinking about the vertebrae and stuff like this, okay? Paul and Timothy and Titus. By the way, Timothy and Titus are not pastoral epistles. Timothy and Titus were apostles, Longer discussion, but they went and they appointed people in other things. But they were vertically aligned with Paul. Okay? And he says, you are my true son. See, this is where that father's heart. Now, here's where you got to go. This is a father with an adult child, not a father with an infant. 
And the challenge is often is that you have somebody in that role and they think they're the father, but like, I need to tell you therefore what you're doing wrong. It ain't there. I don't parent my 21 year old son the way I did when he was five. And even when he was five, I tried to help him make decisions and call up his heart and call up what was noble in him and good and strong. By the way, pray for him. He is right now in Colorado at Buena Vista um, at a Wild at Heart boot camp yes. with his buddy Brendan. And so um, that's an amazing thing. And John Eldridge sewed into my life. I went out there for that. I went out for advanced training. That, that really did a lot for me. Okay, so that's vertical alignment. You got that? Secondly, you can have horizontal with a convening apostle. So for instance, the Council of Jerusalem, when they call everybody together because of this craziness that's going on with, you know, well, it happens a number of times, but with Peter, right? And it's actually James who wasn't even one of the disciples. It's James, the brother of the Lord. He's yet another apostle. There were more than 12 of them, folks. There are more than 12 now. There are many that will call themselves that that probably really aren't. And there are many that are being apostles that nobody's calling them that and they couldn't care less. Because it's not about the title, it's about just moving with what God's got to do. It's about bringing alignment to people so the anointing can flow. It, okay, got this so far? Vertical, horizontal, then there's functional. So you can be part of a focus or an outreach or something that's going like that. That's for a short time. And then there's territorial, which is grouped around geography. So do you see the, the orange or yellow college thing? That could be the same person each time in a different alignment. And I will just tell you, there's primary and secondary. Primary is usually there's just one apostle that you're aligned with for that anointing, okay? But then you can have many secondary alignments where, because you're part of this group and you're part of there and you're getting this, you can move around. The idea is not that it's competitive. I love this phrase from Peter. It's not that we're in competition, we're in cahoots. <laughs> if you're in the new apostolic model. The new apostolic model is not about being possessive. So Gail's going to go to Cuba with Rick. Bless her, I want her to be in that. Okay? I want her to experience that. Kay's going too, back again. Yeah, right, you know? Different thing. This is not about trying to control you. This is about getting you what you need so you can do what's supposed to be done. But I, I need to mention this, just, and I had this in another place, I moved it around. This is David after Saul was in the cave and David had a chance to cut off, right? He, he had a chance to murder him. And instead he goes and finds where his robe is, cuts a section off it, and it says he felt convicted by that. He felt convicted that he had done that. I mean, David so respected Saul, even though Saul was out to get him, I need you to understand, sometimes the persecution might come from another model. You need to not recoil on them, but listen to this. Moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. Know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand. Yeah. Do you get that? Yeah. If God is calling you to a new thing, you need to be... Find alignment. This isn't so that you've got your butt covered. There's a helpful part of that. But this is so that you're moving in the juice that you need. Okay? You need the anointing and the power of that. Go on out and do it on your own. You can do that because, remember, there is no mediator between God and man except the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to have anybody. It can be just you and Jesus, but the, the fact of the matter is we are designed to work in alignment together. Find the people whose hearts connect. Where is your primary alignment? Where are your secondary alignments? Don't get those confused. And then this was a line actually from Abigail. Abigail speaks this to David while David is still out on the run. And she says, the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord. This is my heart. I don't want to be fighting any of my battles. I only want to be fighting the ones he's got for us. Okay? And that includes nothing with, with, a, with another different model. I don't need to do that. I don't need to compete. I want to be in cahoots. I love that word, right? You know what that means, right? We're, okay. Collaborating together. So let me throw a couple other things in here just to keep you thinking. I'm not going to spend time on this. There are four different levels when you're getting aligned. You can be in community. You can be in community. That means you're there and the, there's alignment coming down, but it's just kind of, you kind of come and go. You're kind of lightly attached. 
There's commitment. That's where you're going the next level more deeply. There's contract where you actually have an understanding, often in writing, of just how this alignment is and how it works. But then there's ultimately the deepest level, which is covenant. Four different levels, and depending upon most of the time, your primary is going to be in a contractual covenantal relationship. Secondaries are going to be in a community or commitment. Do you get? Okay. I'm not giving a lot of definition to this. I'm going to keep rolling because I want to just get done. But it's a deeper and deeper level. And then how does this work? This is my own little thing trying to figure out ways to understand. I was commissioned and aligned under Chuck Pierce, Peter Wagner, and Doris Wagner. Okay? Two different times in two different offices. And I've tried to understand how it works. And there's threefold for me. One is the relationship. It is not legalistic. It's not a matter of control. There is relationship there. There's connection. We know. We're at the conferences. How are you? Doesn't mean there have to be long, drawn-out conversations, but I'm not a stranger. And we have times we've shown up there and Chuck's come up and said, oh, I was praying for you guys while I was in France. Really? Okay. <laughs> when was that? <laughs> Knowing his schedule, that could have been last week, last year, last month. You never know. So, but there is a relationship there. It, it's real, it's, it's connected, and it works by influence. And by the way, it's going to go back and forth. This is not a one-way thing. Secondly, it's revelation. Even though we're not out in Texas where our alignment is, I track with what Chuck is releasing on revelation. And when Peter was alive, the same thing, right? Because that's part of, he's my, a primary thing. And I'm moving in his juice that's coming down there, so I want to hear what the Spirit is saying to him. Yeah, you get this? Okay. So to just show up and say that I know him and never track what he's saying, how much do I really know him? Do I know where he's gone? Do I, how is my alignment then? Am I keeping the communication? Because I don't have to be face to face to get a relationship with Chuck. His words and teaching connecting with me. I have people, we have a lot of, more and more people now that I'm connected to relationally by phone. They watch the replays on the deck. Okay. There's relationship going on. There's a connection going in there. Okay. And it's not simply what they move in, but it's also how they do so. This is part of the critical part for me. I have to align with somebody that's not only in the what, but in the how. Okay. We have been anointed, we've been set in place here under a watchman apostolic anointment. That means we understand times and seasons. Chuck is predominantly an Issachar anointed prophet and apostle. So we move in some of that juice and awareness of times and seasons and try to help you dial into that. That's part of the DNA that works there. But it's not just a what he moves in, it's a how. If you've ever watched Chuck, he's not a yeller, he's not a screamer, he's not a shouter, he'll get firm, but he'll talk with you, he'll converse. Okay? I like that about him, he'll be real. And I think this is also what happens, there's an imprint of that core character. Where is your primary alignment? You have to know that will begin to imprint on you. Okay? So if they're like this, what? Bless them. And I run into people that have, you know, they'll have a cadence in the way they pray or the way they preach. And I know somebody's imprinted. It's like I can't judge that, but I just, that's just part of, you, you can really see it. And then finally, there's a resource alignment as well, which goes relational resources. In other words, I've got resources that are shared with people. You need to connect with so-and-so. Let me do that, right? We did that. Gail did that with Kathy knew Gail. Gail knew me. I knew the primary apostle up in, a, up in Alaska. So we just connected. We share relationships so that Kathy then could come into an alignment for that specific function, for that assignment, and move in the juice and in the grace and power that Mary does up there, okay, who's an apostle up there. And it's relationship, it's prayer, and it's finances. You need to understand, we do not tithe and give into this ministry. We give up. We go up into the next level because I'm sowing into the juice that's coming out through Chuck. <laughs> and was and still through Peter's legacy and Doris is still there. Okay? We sow out of the ministry. First portion goes out of the ministry, and then personally we do. Because you have to sow into something that's bigger than you are. Chuck uses this phrase, more legitimate. Okay? And so because of that, we're sowing into stuff that's in the nations. We're sowing into stuff in the different spheres. I mean, we, we have to be 
connected with something bigger. But where you're connected is really important, guys. I, I've, I've had discussions with leaders and sometimes they are just not well aligned because what's in their heart to do is not in the heart of there. What they're really called to do, those folks are in certain, and it, it doesn't mean they're not great people, but that's not where they should be aligned. Okay, I'm sorry, am I being too? Okay, and it's a two-way flow, okay? It's a two-way flow. When I go somewhere, a lot of things that, that I wanna do is I wanna sow into that ministry, even if they're calling to see about aligning with me. Because I wanna bless them. And then if they want to sow something back and it works out, great. But I want to sow into their growth. I want to listen more than I talk. I want to draw up that thing. I believe that's part of the new model because it's not about us. It's about the whole body getting mobilized. It's that the breath comes in, you stand up, and you're an army. You're not a general or a admiral. You're an army. It's the only way that it's going to happen. Okay. So... I like this picture of these people looking at this display in an art gallery. Can these bones live? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. There's a lot of noise and a lot of rattling when things get working together, but there's often no life. Lots of sound sometimes, but no real life. It is ultimately about life. You get that from the anointing, right? It's about life. It's not about forcing people into unity. When it's life and it's anointed, they come into unity. And it's a blessing because they're different. But they're gathered around a commonality of life. Okay, so the question is, this is a, this is a guy on a carrier doing what they call an 18-point tie-down on a plane. When they're in rough seas, there's 18 different points that they use to anchor that plane down. The reality is, that's fine when you're in a really rough storm, but the problem is, is that the storm passes and many of you just stay there or somebody doesn't let you loose. So I want to encourage you, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Therefore, do not submit again to a yoke. Oops, went by. Therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. That was legalism in Paul's day for that, but a lot of times it's constraints of certain ways. In fact, in that very letter in Galatians, he talks about how he had to rebuke Peter they're trying to move back some people back under some old structures. Okay. So you align to get anointed, get armed, get aimed, get accelerated, and get airborne. I mean, I know I'm playing with A's, okay? Stretched my vocabulary there a bit. So let me do the part. Oops, back, 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 go back. Mm -hmm. This is on the replay, so if you need it, you can, hopefully it'll be uploaded by tomorrow morning. So here's, here's where I cringe, because I have to. I have been commissioned and anointed twice. I went in first time with Peter and Chuck and Doris to simply, <laughs> I just wanted to be no, you know, commissioned in the sphere of business and in the church to lead and to teach. I wanted to be as far away I could from anything. And so I get there and they're doing that and Chuck is praying over us and he just releases a whole anointing over me as a prophet. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. You have to sometimes go with what God releases, okay? And then Years later, God had God. I have a lot of arguments with God. You have to understand how this works. And I had to go back and submit again to be prayed over, anointed, and commissioned as an apostle. And I need you to know how hard that was for me because, like, I, I the religious titles just immediately. Ugh. And to me, I don't know. I, I have. It's not about me. And I'm, I've had people that are calling me on the carpet going, you're right, it's not about you, but it is about what you're carrying. And so I'm gonna tell you this one quick story because it, this is not a story, it's a dream. Because it articulates my heart. In this dream, in this smoky, wooded area, a whole bunch of us wandering around, lost, just trying to get it. 
There was smoke and fire, it was dangerous. We moved out into kind of a cliff area. There was a whole bunch of us. I think I was one of the older people there. It was this rough stone face, and then across there was this deep, deep gulf. And on the far side over there, probably, I don't know, maybe 500 feet, there was another steep cliff that came up. And over there were all these other trees and vegetation. And it spread out over, over this way as well. The gulf got smaller over this way, so you could actually, if you went over the far left, you could actually walk over but it was unknown where to go. And so I looked down and there is a cutout in this face and it's the shape of, of like a tree trunk kind of thing with the roots going down and with the branches going out like this. There were five or seven, I can't remember how many on the branches, but they weren't showing the full thing. It was like an artist interpretation where you kind of just show part of it, right? And then the rest you're filling in. But it was that, and so I'm looking down at this, and I noticed that I am wearing a medallion just like that shape. And so, I go, okay, you know. So I take this off, and I set it down into that, and it fits. And when it fits, it becomes like a PowerPoint slide with these arrows, you know, those kind of glossy arrows? And it shoots from each one of these things, shoots right over that gorge. It arches over with an arrow. And I mean, it's, it's like, it's a graphics arrow, right? And each one of those goes off. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, in my dream, I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. But what stunned me is that no sooner had that arrow started to cross the gorge than there was some young guy that was getting on it and running. So that when the arrow landed, he was off and running into the woods. And I woke up and I heard one phrase, ancient pathways. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the hard part. I, that's something that I'm, I'm carrying. I'm screwed up in so many ways. I, I'm, fine. I'm okay with the fact of calling myself a train wreck just because I, the outside of the train has been dumped over and rusted and bent and dinged, but inside the boiler's fine because there's an engineer and there's a brakeman and there's a fireman. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who operate that. And it's not about me, but it is right now about something I'm carrying. And it's carrying an understanding. There's some sort of Issachar anointing. There's a, just a deep desire to see people come alive in what God's given them. So it's kind of weird. People say, well, most people you want to align with is because they've got this great vision and they're going somewhere. My vision isn't so much about that. It's about you. Yes. What do you need? Because <laughs> I don't know what all that looks like. You may go off and do something that I could never in a million years imagine doing. That shouldn't hold me back from seeing June free to do what she needs to do and helping her get what she needs. So my encouragement for you is to understand where and how you're aligned. Look at relationship. Look at whether or not there's revelation. Are you tracking with that? You know, you say, well, I go to so-and-so there. I'm aligned with them. Okay. And how often are you there? And do you know them? And are you tracking with what they're releasing? And are what they're releasing, is that who you are? Oh, no, they're off here talking about this, this, and this. Okay, well, that's probably not your best primary alignment. And it may not be here. We're constantly telling you, assess whether you're still supposed to be here. Alignments can be temporary. You're here for a season. You're on this carrier. We are not going to hold you back. Time to get you off onto another assignment. We want to be the first ones to help launch you. This carrier, so you weigh the heart and mindset of the person, the apostle you're looking to align with, and then you take it to the Lord and you say, okay, Lord, is this it? And then you look at that 3R formula and see how am I doing? So this is our heart's desire, okay? If you want to align here, this is where we want to send you. And we don't know where your ultimate destiny is. We'll help you try to fight that through. But it's about you getting aligned with what God does. And if that means you fly off this to go land on another ship, then great. We want to be in cahoots, not in competition. Did I say it well enough, Gail? Am I really? Oh, cahoots? Okay. I'm sorry, I went longer than I planned. You okay back there, Kathy? You just some of you got long drives. You came up from Florida. You came from Thomasville. You came from all over. Lord, we just thank you for this what what you're doing in the earth. Lord, I thank you that 
I think you are setting another set of rails out there, another parallel track. It's, it's just you're moving with the people that want you. Some are in that institutional structure, some are not. So Lord, we just call them in, call them in, call them in. Lord, show us how we're to help them find a way through. It is about Jesus. And the unity will come from life and knowing that it's about life and from that anointing. And then it comes as a byproduct as we move with you in that. Lord, thank you for these crazy ones that align with us because they've been in debt or distress or discontent or depressed or any number of the other D words. But Lord, you will not leave them there because you're building them up again into mighty men and women of God. Lord, we love you and we just seal this word now that you will protect it, you will oversee it, you will correct me and whatever else needs to be done so we can keep moving forward. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.